Sandy. Oh, there. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Farm Table Foundation's virtual live event with Paul Oman, who's a favorite local artist in the area. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is Mike Scott. I'm the program director. Uh, Farm Table's mission is to build local food culture, and we do that in a variety of ways through building community, supporting conservation, and teaching the local crafts around local food. So you might be asking what we're doing with, with an art show, but we also have this lovely art gallery because we really want to support local artists. And of course, artists many, in many ways help us see in new ways. And I think one of the challenges for us is, is how to see our food and our food choices in new ways. So those of you who aren't familiar with us, we have a restaurant and we have an art gallery and a learning center all under one nonprofit. So again, welcome. Um, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, really delighted to have Paul with us. As many of you are probably familiar with his work, he's uh, known around the country and indeed around the world for his work as a artist. Mike, thank you so much. It's just so fun to be here tonight and I'm really excited to do a couple of demonstrations for you. I'm gonna do a couple of quick little watercolor demonstrations over the next hour. And each of those will only take 10 or 15 minutes. And I want to talk with you just a little bit also about landscape art as story, experience, and language, and how that functions. It's been a, a really fun journey for me to, uh, to learn about this. But before I do that, I first want to say thank you to Farm Table and for hosting this event and for all that they've done to help promote my work in the community here. A uh, wonderful organization, wonderful restaurant if you have a chance to come and, and uh, have a meal here. And I want to introduce my family who is with me. So they are going to flip the camera around. And there's Jana. Hi, everyone. And Kelsey. Kelsey is our daughter. She's a senior in high school this year. And then our other daughter, Emily, is not here with us tonight. She is off riding horseback somewhere. And our son, Tommy, is at college. So. Um, Again, glad that you're here. And again, if you have questions, just enter them in the chat and we'll take those as we go. So, um, just a little bit about my story. I'm Paul Oman, and I have been painting for about 40 years. And I started by taking some lessons from a lady in, in my hometown here, Amory, when I was in fifth grade. And just every Monday night, I'd go to her place after school a few sessions in the fall, a few in the winter, a few in the spring. I started with acrylic and the next year I switched over to oil painting and then I tried watercolor in there. I really didn't like watercolor at first. It's kind of hard to control and all that, but over time I just really became hooked on the medium of paint and being able to try and depict something on a two-dimensional surface that reads three-dimensionally. There's something really fascinating about that to me. And, and back in the 80s, there were a lot of wildlife artists uh, such as Terry Redlin and David Moss and, and all of these artists. And I was inspired by the work that they did. And I thought, wow, how can they just take something just like paint and put it on this flat surface and make it look realistic? And so I kept uh, trying to emulate that. And the story just continued to unfold as time went on. But if you would have asked me 20 years ago, you know, what do you paint? I would have said I paint trees and water and ducks and things like that or buildings. But today that's evolved over time. Today what I paint more so than objects would be light and shadow and trying to catch a sense of the feeling of time and place. And when, when you can capture that sense of feeling of time and place, then I think your viewer can enter into a story that the painting is trying to convey. And it could be a story different than I intended because I've noticed that especially when I do paintings for live audiences, um, I don't wanna over explain the painting that I do because in the end, everybody comes with, away with an experience that relates to their own life. And that's the power of art, it becomes another language um, just literally like another language that we could learn uh, to communicate with others. So I want to bring you into that a little bit tonight and we're going to start with a demonstration and I'll talk through a few of these concepts as we go. Uh, so Kelsey will bring the camera up here and 
uh, we'll start with, um, I, if you look up above for just a second, Kelsey, you see some of these larger paintings I do. My hand will give you some scale there to the size. This is a watercolor. But I'm gonna do a couple of quick ones tonight that are eight inches by 10 inches. So they're pretty small. And just to try and get a sense of time and place. So I'm gonna begin by putting water on this watercolor paper, that's it. Just pure clean water. And you have to let this soak into the fibers of the paper just a bit in order to allow that paint to do, to do its thing, to really glow once it gets in there. So now that that's soaking in, what I'm gonna try and paint for you here first is just a simple landscape scene. Uh, and I really enjoy spending time in Northern Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin canoeing the boundary waters, especially northern Minnesota. And here, when you go up there, you get all kinds of different moods and emotions and feelings out in nature. And some are happy and peaceful, and some are scary and threatening. But if we can quickly try and put together a suggestion here of a storm that has passed by we might be able to tap into some of these emotions that result when you actually experience something like this in nature. So for those of you that are artists that are with here tonight, I generally start with the primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. And I break through these primaries by overlapping them just like this. And when they overlap and they get stirred together a bit, you'll have orange, greens, and purples that form the secondary colors and everything in between. There's an infinite number of colors. So you can see it's not very particular how we lay these on here to start with. I'm gonna add a little more intense yellowish orange in here. So this probably looks like a big mess <laughs> so far. Any of you agree with that? <laughs> I'm gonna darken this and then I'm gonna take <clears throat> a hair dryer. You'll see my hair dryer on the table here and speed this process up by drying that. Now, before it's too dry, this is all about timing here with watercolor. I would like to add a few additional colors in there. Let's put some gray in here and see how when it's still wet, it blurs and it kind of does its thing on its own so you don't have to try and define every cloud. I'm gonna add a little bit of that gray down here because often when you see a storm passing by, you'll have some of these gray clouds in front of it that are down lower. And we can reflect some of that in the water. But something else that appears, I'm gonna spray this just slightly, it's getting a little bit too dry. But something else that can appear, of course, is a rainbow. And that can be a real challenge to paint in watercolor, but we're gonna try it. I think we're at the right stage here to drop that in. Get the right moisture, let's go. So I'm just gonna put yellow, red, and blue in for the rainbow instead of all of those colors. Roy G. Biv, for those of you that <laughs> remember that. Uh, there's another, just like that. But 
this rainbow is going to reflect if this is calm water down into the water. So I'm going to suggest that reflection in here like so. Then I'm going to finish by drying this off. Now one thing that Mike or I did not say yet is that uh, all of you who are on viewing tonight, this painting and the next one I do um, will be in a drawing at the end. So you might win one of these paintings and we'll just mail it to you. No cost, entirely free. Okay, I think that's dry enough to move on. As I mentioned before in watercolor, it's all about timing and getting that correct. If the timing is off, then you get water lines and, or they call them balloons or, or uh, cauliflower and all kinds of different names that aren't, aren't a lot of fun to deal with. So. Here is where I'm going to begin to define the actual landscape now. So you'll begin to recognize some things. And as, as I put this in here, uh, what I'm actually doing is defining edges now. So an edge is where two shapes meet one another. We have the shape of the sky meeting the shape of the land, the horizon. And the edge itself allows for the formation of a larger shape. Now, if you haven't heard that before, that might sound really strange. But when you keep all those things in mind as you're doing a painting or a drawing, you can begin to think about the shapes that you're creating rather than the objects. And then you want various size shapes to offset one another throughout your picture. And it's best if they're not all the same size. Now let's see if we can create the illusion of depth here. Take this. Typically when you when an object is farther away there there's often more blue in the object, blue color. So I'll add more blue as it goes further away. I want this to look like a peninsula of land here, but very subtle so it merges together. Maybe there's an island or two out there. And then this will come back up over here. There's another piece of land. Okay. And we're almost done with the painting. We just have to bring some reflections in here now. So, so far, it's looking all right, but let's try and enhance the realistic appearance of this by mirroring the landscape down in the water. While this is wet, where each dark tree is here, I'll suggest there's dark below that, like so. Okay. And depending on how calm the day is, how calm the lake is, you will see reflections back further into the lake. Eventually it turns into like a mirage or where, where there aren't any, or maybe there's a breeze and the ripples break up the reflections so you don't really see it. And the last thing I will do here is in the foreground, let's give a surface to the water 
and just add a few subtle ripples like this. Cut through. And there we have a little suggestion of a painting. And it tells a story in various ways. Um, the most obvious way is if you've been to a place like this, you might say, oh, that looks like this lake, or I've seen a rainbow like that before. But maybe beyond just the actual physical location of it, the story becomes an emotional story where someone is reminded of something that happened at some point based on the various things they see, the darks, the shadows, the lights, and in particular, the color. Because color is the most expressive form of emotion in a painting. And I hope this quick little watercolor brings out some of that. All right, so any questions so far? Is there anything in the chat there yet, Mike? Well, Paul, just a couple questions. Um, when, sure. you, when you spritzed the painting earlier, I assume that was just water. And then the other question, yeah. you usually don't dry with a uh, dry, hair dryer, right? It's just so you're doing that for us to speed up the process? Right. I, the hair dryer, sometimes you lose some of this granulated effect, which if you hold it up closer, Kelsey, can you see that there? It's called sedimentation in watercolor, which is a desirable effect. And the pigments of the paint settle into the divots of the paper. This is a cold press paper. It's somewhat rough. It allows for that appearance. If you use a hair dryer, sometimes it eliminates that effect. Uh, this effect to me adds more interest and variety to the, the painting. I see somebody ask, what kind of watercolor paper am I using? This is Arches. 140 pound cold press paper. And Arches, it's 100% cotton. It's a rag paper made in France. And it has a tough, durable surface to it. So you can get various surfaces. Some are softer, some are harder, like Arches. Um, if I'm painting on a vertical, I usually like a softer paper because it flows more slowly and I have more time to work with that. Okay, good questions. And the paint I'm using, I'll answer that too. It's mostly Windsor and Newton professional grade watercolor paint and it's made in England, but there are lots of different paints out there. So if you're into watercolor painting, I just say experiment and try different pig pigments, different paints. They each have different properties. So you might like some better than others. Yeah. So this one is done. All right. So to take a little break before we get to the next painting, I'll talk about a couple of the paintings that we have in the gallery here. Kelsey, you want to just do a quick sweep around here so they kind of just swing around so they can see the full gallery. You see, I haven't been here. And in this location, there are demonstrations that are done, like cooking demonstrations, all kinds of different demonstrations. Um, but we'll start with this painting here. So as I mentioned, I love uh, going up north and canoeing and camping and things like that. So I will naturally gravitate towards painting something that inspires me. And the seasons of the year inspire me too. Living in the upper Midwest, we definitely get those seasons. So here we have the trilliums blooming in the foreground. And for me, just seeing the trilliums, uh, that brings, evokes so many different experiences and emotions over the years for me. Uh, one of my favorite flowers in the woods in the springtime. And of course the loons with the babies that have just hatched and one's on the back and the other's out in the water yet. Uh, but to break this painting down uh, into more of the theory of art, you can see that we have edges here. So here's an edge, an edge that meets uh, like the sky and the horizon come together. So now we have a shape that is formed in the sky that merges together with another shape here you know, and you have one shape after another. And if all these shapes end up being about the same size and spaced equally, the painting becomes uninteresting and it becomes relatively boring because your brain just loses interest in moving from one thing to another. But if you can keep things varied in size, so the shape of this tree is wider and bigger than this, um, it tends to add more interest to the piece itself. So that's the relationship of the, the uh, 
proportions, the composition of the paint and then. So things are offset. It's heavier over here, but then you have to balance it over here. The loons aren't right in the center. They're a little bit offset. The island is split, not right in the middle, but a little ways in, maybe a fourth or fifth of the way in. Everything is asymmetrical, and that tends to hold it together in a more interesting way. At least that's how my mind and my eye sees that. And this is a watercolor painting. It's behind alter, uh, UV protective glass and conservation matting. So should not fade or anything like that. The title is Song of the North. The image is 28 inches by 40 inches. And the price of this one framed is $2,800. And if you're interested in any of these, we can definitely ship them anywhere into the country or maybe even uh, deliver them. And then where you're at. There's a question. Oh yes, answer, that's a question. Do you do sketches of your paintings before you actually paint it? Yes, do I do sketches before I actually paint it? Yes, I do. Uh, I'll for sure do a pencil sketch, but sometimes I do a watercolor sketch. The next painting I do for you, I did a black and white watercolor sketch before, beforehand. I did it earlier today. I'll show you that so you can see the process. Here's a painting. This is a combination of watercolor and acrylic. So I layered it. I started with the watercolor, which gives a nice soft effect. And I wanted a strong object to anchor the composition of this painting. So I chose this big white pine tree here. And this is from up on the Chippewa Flowage up in northern Wisconsin. And this group of trees here, I thought, carried a lot of heavy weight, but I wanted to keep them in shadow with just a very small amount of sunlight hitting the tree as, as though it peeks through the woods. You'll see that once in a while. Also touching the edge of this birch or aspen tree over here, keeping most of this in shadow. And it was a painting that I had done all in watercolor to start with. But as I went on with it, um, I decided I wanted to brighten up this part and experiment. So I just went over the top of it with acrylic paint, which is easy enough to do on watercolor paper with all this texture and was hoping to give the birch tree itself that textured bark that so, so you can almost feel the tree by looking at it. There's a three dimensional quality to that along with these leaves. It helps create a three dimensional perspective here. And so again, our composition is asymmetrical and off balance and trying to balance the violets and the oranges. All right, I'll try and face this way more so you can hear. And this painting is 29 inches by 41 and framed is larger and it is $3,500. We'll look at three more. I'll do another demonstration here. Oh, we got a couple of questions as well. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, someone earlier asked about what size brushes do you recommend having? Sure. Uh, it, I recommend having a variety of rounds and flats. Let's go back here and take a look really quick. So this would be a round. Uh, see if I rotate it, it's the equal width all the way around. And it usually comes to a point. I like them if they come to a point, especially when they're wet, they'll be at a point. This would be a flat. So it's skinny this direction, but wide the other way. And also very useful for doing like big wide wash areas, big areas. The round works for that too though. And I have brushes that are two inches wide, three inches wide, even four inches wide when I do those big canvases for audiences. And I'll show you one of those in a minute. It's over there. Uh, plus a few littler brushes around these are also rounds they come to a point like that but there's a brush that's sort of like a round but it's long and skinny and this is called a liner liner l-i-n-e-r or a rigger same thing and it creates you can fill it with lots of paint and water and you can go a long ways before it runs out it's great for doing branches on trees and things like that another question uh, what's the weight of the watercolor paper in the painting you're talking about? Is it different to accommodate the acrylic? This one here is a 300 pound paper. Uh, you could paint acrylic on 140 pound or 90 pound just fine. It works on all weights. I like painting acrylic on watercolor paper better than on canvas personally, just because of the texture. Uh, so here's acrylic on canvas. 
And again, this is 36 inches by 36, and it's an image of, of the north shore of Lake Superior at sunrise, looking up the shore to the northeast. And I just, I've always been taken in by that scene up there and wanted to capture this in those tones, those hues of color that come in early morning. And if you squint at this picture, just blur your eyes just a little bit, and you can view right in on that, Kelsey, you will see how your darkest darks are right here. And the rest of these are middle values for the most part. And then you have a light vertical line here with the sun, with the sun and the reflection. You get this vertical line and it reflects off the rocks here. I was trying to get this feel of these slabs of rock that you'll come across up there. And if you look at the color in these rocks, you might, when you look at it closely, you might say, well, that's not realistic color at all. But as you look at different colors in different times of the day, you might discover all kinds of different colors you can see in there. And it creates an emotional effect to, to play with different colors when you paint it. And one more thing, so here, the clouds are large up on top, more medium size here, and smaller as you get further away. And that's another good proportionate balance to have, is to have a large, medium, and small. Uh, and it also creates this dome-like feel of the sky if you have clouds when they're larger up overhead and smaller down toward the horizon. We have another question. Maybe okay. Michael's going to ask it. Sure. Yeah, um, a couple of people said, do you sometimes use photos to start the process or paint from a photo? Like many times. I, I take a lot of photos and I will just use parts of photos or sometimes the whole picture. If you go out looking for the perfect scene, you're going to take that photo and try and paint it just as it is, you might be disappointed and feel like, oh, I just can't get anywhere with this. But you just have to notice things, I think, that catch your eye, where you say, oh, I really like that for some reason. Take a picture of it. And then when you get home, you can manipulate it and play with it. Zoom in on it, zoom out, crop different areas, and you might find a piece in there that really makes a nice composition, and you can paint that just as it is. Or you can use a piece of that photo and tie it into another composition. All right, we'll go and look at two more acrylics here. So I'll start with the one on top. This was a lot of fun. One of my favorite paintings, I'd say, that I have at this point. And I was driving in southeastern Minnesota, heading down. Uh, I was taking my son. My son and I were traveling to visit colleges. And I saw this scene as we were driving. I think it was on Highway 52, I'm not sure. Close to Lanesboro, Minnesota, somewhere in there. And the strip crop farming, I just like the ribbons in the fields uh, that made this pattern. And those bales were actually there in the field. But the other thing that is a challenge sometimes in painting, and artists will talk about this a lot, is the subject of painting green colors. They can, they can turn out very artificial. Oftentimes artists will avoid painting them. And I thought this scene is all about green. And I like green growing up in the upper Midwest with the lush green landscapes. So I wanted to try and um, really, I don't know if exploit is the right word, but use greens to their fullest extent here. And as you go through greens, if you paint them, you have to vary them. Just keep changing them slightly as you go through, and that's what keeps them interesting, rather than making a large shape the same color. It's always changing, and those subtle changes create an illusion of depth, and they help tell a story. I added some cattle. That barn wasn't there. There was a barn off to the right. I brought that in. I made this up in the foreground, and I added that monarch butterfly on the milkweed, which I think adds uh, a piece, at least for me, I feel like my eye goes out there first and then comes back. But underneath this painting, there's a pinkish color I painted, an underpainting. And so by letting some of that show through, it gives a glowing quality that can come through uh, in the final painting. And then this one here is about a mile away from my house where we live. And I looked at this scene many times, but one morning, it was a January morning, a very mild January morning. I walked, was walking down there and I saw this 
and it, I was so inspired by it, I took a few pictures, came back to the studio and painted it. I just liked everything about the scene. I painted it basically as, it, as I saw it, but enhanced the colors in order to do what I wanted it to do. And just these leading lines that take you back, uh, the diagonals, a one point perspective here brings the eye back to this area. But just this little bit of green in here, I think, adds an interesting um, opposite to the color wheel of the reds. They're not strong reds, but they lean toward the red side of the color wheel. The green and red work in favor of that. So these two paintings here are both 36 inches by 36, and they have floating frames on them, which cast the shadow. And they are $2,800. All right. Oh, we also have a question about, um, you, have, you find that you have a formula for creating shadows, like, like in the snow. Yes. For shadows. Uh, the first thing I'd say is just experiment and paint millions of them. <laughs> uh, the second thing I would say is the further away from, if you're painting a cast shadow, what I mean by that, so like take, take this object here, for instance. It's an object that's actually casting a shadow. And this isn't, this isn't a very good example to show you, but this is better right here. Closer to the base of the object that's throwing the shadow, it is usually cooler in temperature. So here it's more blue, but it turns to a more violet as you come out here for some object, a tree or something was over here casting a shadow because more scattered light gets to come in and around and begins to warm that shadow up. And just those subtle nuances in your painting will create a more realistic look and feel. Even if the person viewing your work is not artistic, they do know what it looks like out in nature, uh, even if they can't describe it. And if you can include that in your picture, it does something that is helpful for the finished product. Yeah, is that, if that didn't answer your question, just send another question. How about another demonstration? Come on over here. I'm gonna tear this one out. Okay, so here's what I worked on this morning. You're welcome for the explanation. I see the comment, thank you. So I was thinking I need to paint something that exemplifies Wisconsin. And what does that more than a barn? <laughs> I guess some Holstein cows would, so we'll add some of, those, some of those in my final painting here. But in this picture, this is, I call this a value sketch, and I did it with watercolor. Um, and I, if you look in a real simple sense at this, light is the white paper, middle value would be the light gray throughout here, and my darkest values, the darkest darks. And again, if you squint at that just a little bit, all three of those will show up real easily, light, middle, dark. And that is really how you need to read any landscape if you're gonna be a value painter, which is primarily what I am. Uh, you could be a pattern painter, value will dominate pattern. So if you're gonna emphasize pattern, you have to back off the values. Or you might be a color painter, like Monet was, is known as a color painter, at least in a lot of his work. He still has values and patterns in his work, but the color, those two, those two values and, and pattern are really backed off. They, and it allows the color to really sing its own song, so to speak. So here though, this will be a value painting. So I sketched that here and I decided in this painting, I wanna add a few cows, a few things like that. So let's see what we can do. Um, so I'm gonna try and make this beautiful fall. Like today here we had just these beautiful blue skies. But since my value sketch shows real light up here, I want to pay attention to that. I'm just painting right on dry paper here. 
start with. There are different approaches to take on this. And anything that is not a middle or a dark, what am I saying here? So I have to paint all the light values and anything that I want to save as a white part of the paper, I need to go around it. So these trees back here, I'll have them glowing in the fall, like fall colors. So I'll start with just this background color. A lot of this will get covered over. And then in the foreground, I was thinking, let's have this be a cornfield that has already been picked or chopped. And then they've let the cattle out into the field. So I'm going to start by just adding that kind of a light background color in there. And this will all have to dry before I can do the middle values. So my approach here is really an approach of traditional watercolor painting. This one is this approach. Like so. Okay. So, and while this is happening, I'm going to move right into some of these middle values, like the silo, for instance. That silo might be glowing some yellow and orange color with all of the vibrancy going on of the day. So let's drop a little of that in there, like so. Let's get a little blue here. And should we have a red or a white barn? That is the question, right? <laughs> I have a couple of seconds to think on that. Can we vote, too... Paul? Can you vote? Yeah, you could vote. I think white will be a stronger impact in this painting, but if you want red, I can do it. <laughs> That's influencing the vote. <laughs> okay. So you'll see how messy watercolor looks at the beginning. You know, let's go to red. We'll go with the red barn. We have two votes for red. Two votes for red. Then we're going with red. And it's one more step of difficulty, but chance to learn what to do or not to do. Let's see here. So I'm going to put that sponge over there. And Paul, uh, can you, Paul, can you say again what you mean by a value painting? Yes. Uh, is it just a meaning of, of how dark and light the various parts of it are? Yep, that's exactly it. How dark and how light it is. So values, think of it as contrast is another, another word that would work. Contrast, light and dark. The reason I thought about painting this particular barn, and I actually I had a picture of the main part of the barn in one silo and I decided to add these other structures to it is because it tells a story. It definitely tells a Wisconsin story. And part of that story literally is in the addition of all these pieces onto the barn. Of course, the main barn, that's probably a 1920 style barn, 30, something like that. But then you have the farm that grew and maybe needed to grow economically in order to survive. So they added on. You know, there's a story definitely to be told there. And artwork can help do that. And as I paint these, I don't want to overly define everything because if I do, then I've taken, I've taken the interpretation away from the viewer. Because the viewer can import their own story into it if they know, oh yes, that is a barn. It reminds me of the barn that is down the road from where I grew up. But if every detail is in there, it might define it away from their own story. And that, that's taken a while to learn because our left brain wants to see and reproduce everything it sees. But our right brain sees the whole picture. And I'm just after the story that the whole picture is telling. 
So I need to dry this before I can do the next step. Yeah, I think that's dry enough. This is where it really gets fun. We start adding in the middle values and the light, the sunlight will start to appear. So that's some burnt sienna and this is cobalt blue. They're opposites on the color wheel. If you stir them a lot, they turn gray, but I'm just doing a little variety here, leaving a few specks of light in there, but what I want to do is set off my subject, which is the barn and the silos. And this middle value will allow me to begin to bring my subject to center stage. Like so, let's add a little more in there. We'll come over here. This uh, tall silo is another part of the story. I thought I'm going to put a harvester silo in there. You know, you know what a harvester silo is? Many of you, I'm sure, do. And the harvester silos became real popular in the 60s, 70s, 80s, in there. And then the farm crisis hit. And there are many harvesters still standing that are not being used. Okay, I'll talk louder. <laughs> All right. And so then I'm looking at my sketch a little bit, trying to figure out what is, how dark should I go? I'm gonna go down to the field out front here. And these perspective lines will really help give depth now, depth of perspective to the painting as those harvested rows of corn. And I don't need to paint every corn stalk, but maybe just like five or 10 like that. Those are kind of large, but it will just indicate that they're there. That's enough. So I'm gonna come back up to the barn and silos now and work on this. And I look here and I see, what I'm gonna do is link all of my shadows together. And I'm gonna mix a deep reddish purple to do that. And I'm just gonna go right over this side of the barn. And then there will be a shadow that the roof is casting right here. So while it is wet, link this together right there and that will go over here like so there'll be a little shadow there um, and then off of this end of the this end of the barn or shed over here be that now while it is still wet i'm going to just paint the shadow on the ground very very important and then the shadow off the side of what's probably the milk house here. Do that, and there'd be a shadow under that overhang of the roof there. Now, there's a really important shadow that the silo is casting right here on the roof of the barn. I'm going to paint that right on there, and it's going to start to really bring this alive. So there's a 
little windows there. Shadow over there. And I wanted a white fence here. So I'm going to paint in between the railings of the fence just to suggest that it's there. Like that. A couple of bits of shadow to fasten this to the ground. Okay. This is all still drying up front. Now let's get the initial color of our harvester silo in there. And so we paint from light to dark in watercolor. And the lightest color is what we have to start with. And since the sun was shining like this way, kind of on my, on the subject, the lightest part was almost straight out toward me. So I can paint the whole silo that lightest color if I want. I might even, whoop, I covered it over. That's okay. <laughs> so I have to let that dry now, then I'll go in there and paint the darker areas. I could get back in there before it's dry and it would, but let's move over to the concrete silo. That part will be dark. And those silos have those patterned white bricks up on the top, two layers always, so they often do. So try and just suggest that up there. Makes it more believable. And then I will take a smaller brush, and bring some of the staves that go across to hold it together. We'll just suggest a few of those in there like that. And there's the chute here that blows the silage in. We'll suggest that in a middle value <clears throat> to start with in a shadow that's cast there. We'll let that dry. And we're not too far from being done. I'm going to suggest a few fence posts here so our cattle don't get away. <laughs> and let's begin with the lighter areas of our Holstein cattle that are out here munching on the corn stalks. So you don't have to really define the cattle all that well. You just need one or two that are believable. And I hope I can get one or two <laughs> believable. If, um, if not, we might have some trouble. we go like that. Be a herd of them here. A couple back here. There's maybe one out. <laughs> it's always common. Might be enough for now. I'm going to let that dry and then we'll put some shadows within them and then some real deep darks. I'm going to dry this and we'll get to our darkest stage. Before I dry it, you can do darks while it's still wet if your paint is really thick and it is almost more effective. So it's just like melted butter in some of these. So sometimes there's an open door in the barn up there. See how it just softly blurs away when it's wet and wet. It's a nice effect. I'm gonna darken that edge of the silo just a bit to bring that out. And maybe a couple other spots here. Maybe there's dark there. Like so. Kind of intensify that. Okay. I'm going to experiment before I dry this. We're going to add our dark blue harvest, our harvester blue, right in here. Like this. And we have that reflected light kind of in the middle of the silo. So we'll leave that a little lighter to try and create that illusion of roundness. 
that worked while it was still somewhat wet. Now if it starts moving together and it's covering it over too quickly for you, that's where you turn the hairdryer on really quick and stop the movement. Uh, we'll put a couple of shadows on there. I think that's enough to tell that story. I'd spend a little more time on this in the studio, of course. But sometimes when you're forced to paint quickly, I find you learn lots of things that watercolor will do uh, that are very beneficial to have in your toolbox, uh, where you, you start to discover you don't need to paint everything in order to make it effective. Tell the story. So those cattle, they need shadows under them. I'm gonna dry this first. Though. Okay, just about done here. We'll put a cast shadow from the cattle. We have to we have to think about which way our sun the sun is shining. So probably like this way. So the shadow is not going to be too large behind the cattle, but just a little bit in there, just to suggest it anchors them to the ground, and it also helps link this shape together with a few of these shadows. So that will be a lot lighter when it dries. It looks really dark right now. But I'm going to use some of this blue. And some colors are transparent. Like cobalt blue is transparent. I can go right over this, and the color underneath will show through. So I want the edge. There's like a white board on the edge up here. I want that to look like it's shadowed. Just adds one more little bit of interest in there. OK. Um, and we could, this is called dry brush, where you use the roughness of the paper with really thick paint, just like this. It skips across the bumps on the paper and creates a, an appearance of texture. It, it can be helpful at times to add to your work. Let's just suggest a few stubbles of corn stalks here, and that's about enough. And oh, of course, I can't forget the last thing before signing it, pigeons. I'm leaving the silo or are gonna land on the silo. There we go. Lots of birds. And then signature. And there it is. Paul, we've had a lot of folks saying, wow, this is beautiful. What a great talent. And thank you. Stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah. And um, someone also has a question. Looks like you're working on a tablet. So you don't worry about the paper under what you're working on. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I usually work on individual sheets of paper. But this tablet works really well. You can see here, it doesn't come through on the backside at all. Um, and if I'm traveling, and I just take a painting kit with me. This is the setup I'll have with me right here. I might have a little easel along as well that I would set it on, but it allows me to quickly paint something, let it dry, flip the page, and then I have uh, a whole journal, a visual journal of the trip I've been on, and it works out really well. The paper will buckle up a little bit, but I, I don't even notice that anymore. I just Continue on and you can flatten it afterwards by wetting the back and weighting it with books. Leave it sit overnight. Um, that does help. Otherwise, that's the approach to watercolor. Really beautiful. And Paul, someone said, how important is it to know when to stop? Uh, that's the most important question in painting. <laughs> because uh, 
I heard one artist uh, say that something like every good painting was ruined, that was ruined was preceded by the words, I'll just add this. <laughs> and then one more thing that's added and all of a sudden it's too much, it's overworked. Um, that's really the death of a, of a painting, especially a watercolor, because it's hard to correct things in watercolor, is if you add too much detail, it starts to look too tight, too rigid, um, too over scrubbed, overworked, and it just doesn't have that fresh feeling to it, that transparent feeling that watercolor is meant to have. Any other questions? Otherwise, well, so I got. Yeah, Paul, we'll, we'll go to the other paintings in a second, but someone did ask if you, if you offer classes, and I think you do. I and do. Yeah. Can you remind me of your, your website, and I'll type it in here. Yeah, so my website is paulomanfineart.com. And come to think of it, I'm, I have a class coming up, which is not even listed on my website at the moment. But it is, if you send me an email through my website, I'll send you a direct link. I'm doing a four session Zoom class in watercolor. And it's through continuing education in Minnesota, South Washington County, and then Hastings, Minnesota Community Ed. They're both linked together to have me teach a class. It starts the last Monday of this month. And I'm going to be offering classes just out of my home studio that are Zoom also. So if you'd like to do that, some will be real short. Um, some are going to be like, pay what you can, just short little 30, 45 minute demos. And others will be full blown workshops. So there'll be a variety of things here that I'll offer. Okay, should we go to the other last couple of paintings? Sounds good, Paul. Okay. Five more, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this painting is something a little different than I typically paint, but I like trying different things. And over the last, I'd say 10 years of painting, I've done so many landscapes that I've gotten outside of that to paint cityscapes and different things. Why not uh, vegetables or fruit or any kind of still life like that? And for the farm table itself, I thought this might be an appropriate painting to have. So it was just fun trying to capture that three-dimensional appearance by, by working with light and shadow on various objects, like this eggplant here. There's so much rich color. It's not just a dark purple. There's so much in there. And then to add that shadow uh, really enhances that. This is acrylic on canvas. And so the radishes, for instance, when you really pile the paint up, uh, you can get a little bit of texture. It's not quite like oil paint, which really piles up nicely. Acrylic tends to flatten out, but you can get different mediums to add to the acrylic paint to try and give it more texture. Um, and that's, that's what I did with this one. So this is called Harmony of Flavors. It's an original acrylic. It's $2,400. It is 24 inches by 30 inches in size. And let's go to the last acrylic. And I have two oil paintings. Oh, we didn't do that big one over there. Yeah, we were going to do that. Uh, so this one here, another one of the Boundary Waters canoe area. I just wanted to do a tall vertical. It's, uh, let's see, 48 inches by 36 inches. And the storm passing and the, the light on the clouds, I'm always intrigued by that. With the calm water, and I just thought that you know, there's maybe a few big drops still falling at the tail end of the storm, but the water is now so calm and it's going to clear off to be a nice evening. So some of you know me as uh, painting in front of live audiences, doing big murals. This is one of those paintings that I did in front of an audience. Uh, there were 400 middle school students that watched me paint this, and it was out at a Bible camp here just outside of Amory. And the uh, the Bible passage for this painting was Isaiah 43. Uh, it was in that chapter where when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You will not be overwhelmed by the waves. And so I was trying to catch something that might uh, be a little bit scary, a little bit ominous, but yet peaceful also with these waves. And the size of a person gives scale to the painting. And that is something that you can use in your paintings, is if you put something in there, people know how big it is, like a cow next to a bar, and they can see how tall that silo is. The same here, 
you know, if I didn't have this person in there, you wouldn't know how big the waves really are. You could guess, but when you see the person there, then you see the scale of the waves. Another addition to this is I use ultraviolet and glow paint, and when I paint at night, so uh, for audiences, if they want it. And so the kids just love that. And so there was a shaft of light here that lit up, and the dove lit up, and there's a cross in here, and there were some other highlights in there uh, as I did that. So it was a lot of fun. And that painting is 48 inches by 66 inches, and it is 3,000. Dollars. Okay, and I we have two paintings left, and I also I also do oil painting. Uh, that's probably what I do the least of these days, but I, I love painting with oil because of the thickness of the pigment. You can pile it up. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, our family was down at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, and one of our family members was in there for a while, and we ended up staying at this hotel. Uh, close to it, and across Highway 94, which is right down below the painting, uh, was the cathedral, the St. Paul Cathedral, and it was it was a comforting image. And every morning, it was in January, the sun would come up and hit the side of that cathedral, and it would just glow. And I loved that light, and there would be steam and smoke and clouds and fog rising up. And St. Paul College is right next to it here. And one morning, the sun hit this in just such a way that I had to take a picture and make a sketch of it and go home and paint it. And I found that to be a nice contrast of peace with the busyness of the freeway, which I left out right below here. The sense of peacefulness in this uh, huge anchoring image that's offset in the left third of the picture with diagonals that lead in various ways, pointing to that. And the uh, oil painting, it's a different, different price category and it takes a while to paint these. Uh, and then I have to glaze over them and six months to a year later, we put a varnish on there. And so this painting is $12,000 framed and the size is 24 by 30 inches. And the last painting I have to share with you tonight is another one of my very favorites. And it's an oil painting. And it's 30 inches by 40 inches. Um, and this painting was born out of an experience that I had while camping in the Boundary Waters canoe area, where it had been a beautiful day. And we were heading for a campsite. And the thunder was coming in the distance. And then the storm hit right after we got into our campsite, just barely got a tarp up. And it lightened and rained and thundered so loud and so violently for 15 or 20 minutes. I couldn't even see 20 feet out in front of me because the rain was coming down so hard and lightning was striking trees around us. And the reason that I know that is because the next morning when we left our site, we went around the island to another campsite that we were thinking about staying at and lightning had hit one of the big pine trees, one of the big white pines like this one here, uh, and exploded the tree. And the tree had fallen over right across the campsite, probably where we would have been sitting at the time. And there's this real sense of, um, of awe and how insignificant and small one is out of the midst of the power of of nature like this. And there's nothing better than to see that storm. We've gone through it and now it's passing away in the distance. So this storm is moving off to the northeast here and the sun, the sunset would be over to the west. And there's still a lightning strike in the distance, but now it's peaceful and it's calm. A couple of ripples left, but it's going to clear off and be a beautiful evening. And so that was my inspiration for this painting. I wanted to frame it with something that would perhaps give thought to the white birch trees of the North Woods and that wonderful bark on the white pine trees, the big white pines of the Northern Coniferous Forest. The title of this painting is Peace and Power and it is $18,500 framed. And that is all I have to share. We can go back over here if there are any more questions. 
Well, Judy has chimed in saying, I love your connection to nature and your artistic expression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Paul, very much. And just so you all know, you, we, we have socially distanced dining and art viewing available. We obviously couldn't have an opening at the same uh, live with you all in our space, but you're welcome to come to Farm Tables Gallery and, and view the paintings, um, you know, with your family or, you know, your, the people in your bubble. <laughs> so uh, you're very welcome to come. Our restaurant hours are nine to three on Thursday nine to eight Friday, Saturday, and nine to three on Sunday. You can look on our website as well for those hours, but you could come see this stuff in, in, in person and it's just beautiful. And yeah, if you have questions, folks, feel free to just stay on a little bit li longer and you can put those in there and, and I'll get them to Paul if you have questions. And yes. yeah, someone also asked if I'll, I'll be uh, sending a recording of this out so you can also watch again and you know, learn again as Paul has taught us during the demos and so on. I'll send the demo out probably tomorrow or early next week. That's great, that's great. And there is a question here, Paul. You used acrylic to intensify color in one painting. Do you choose other reasons to use acrylic with watercolor? It's it just, for one thing, it's just variety. I always find that I can learn something new if I'm mixing different media mediums together. Um, it's, you can actually use acrylic very much like watercolor if you dilute it. If you break it down too much, it kind of breaks up the pigment and the medium that holds it together. But it creates a very, very vibrant color. And it's, it's fun to try, so I encourage you to try it. Any other questions? Uh, thanks so much, spectacular. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So impressive. Some really nice comments coming in, Paul. Yeah. Oh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And I know Mike's going to do the drawing now. And so yeah. we'll need to get the addresses of whomever wins so we can send the pictures to you, the paintings to you. Yeah. And also, if, you want, if you're interested in any more of my work, just go to my website, paulholmanfineart.com. And I've got paintings there. And I also am happy to do commissioned work if you have something you would like painted, maybe as a gift or for yourself or something like that. Yes, and if you'd like to come in and see the paintings in person and decide if you wanted to purchase one, that, that you'd be welcome to do that, of course, as well. Um, let's see, one other question, Paul, was do you use open acrylics? Yes, um, so do I use open acrylics? Do you mean heavy body or standard body acrylics? or fluid, I'm not quite sure. Oh, do I, yeah. I guess I'm misunderstanding. I'm not, I'm not sure what it either, it just said, do you use open acrylics? So I'm not sure what she meant either. If, unless you just mean open to the air. Slower I, drying. Yeah, they dry fast. So I just squeeze out what I need from tubes on a pallet or wax paper or something like that. And I just use it till it's gone. And I paint pretty fast with acrylic so it doesn't dry up too much. And you can add um, drying agents or retarders to it that slow down the drying. All right, thank you. Well, we do um, have a couple of paintings to give away and folks, I. I just um, randomly had a a number a computer program pick numbers out of a hat, so to speak, and then I associated those numbers with names on your as you registered. So uh, the first painting, the Boundary Waters, uh, went to Jay Carlson. If Jay is on here, I don't. I'm not sure Jay is here. There are a few people signed up who didn't end, end up making it on here. So if I don't see Jay's name here. So I'm gonna go to the second person I drew for that painting, and that's Joanne Clark. Joanne, I see Joanne's iPad. I'm assuming that's Joanne Clark. So Joanne, if you can type in to confirm that that is indeed you, that would be great. And then the, the barn painting, um, 
the person that was drawn is Gretchen Michaels. And I believe I see Gretchen's uh, name on here. Gretchen, if you're there, if you could confirm that as well. And I'll, I'll yes, Gretchen's here. <laughs> Great. So if you, um, I can just get in touch with you or you can email me. I put your, I put my email in there earlier, program director at farmtablefoundation.org. And I can get the email, the address to you, Paul. That sounds good. For Gretchen Michaels and Joanne Clark. Great, thank you. And thank you for that generosity, Paul. Oh, you're welcome, very welcome. Well, this has been really fun. Paul, thank you for the idea of doing the paintings and walking us through the, the, the paintings that you have up. It's working here, it's been a joy to have your work there for months now, so appreciate it so much. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who haven't been to Farm Table, hope you'll come visit us sometime. Check out the art, check out the food in the restaurant. And we have a lot of classes coming up, anywhere from a talk on coffee and climate change to some Swedish baked uh, cakes to lefse making, just a whole range of classes, uh, working to build a local food culture in our community and support local farmers. So hope you'll check us out. And with that, I'll be in touch soon with an email with sending you a link to this uh, video so you can see it. And folks, uh, Paul, a lot of people saying thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, good night, all. Please take good care of each other. Yep. Thank you for coming. Good night. Right. Thank you for your help. <laughs>